today's recording and slides will be available at www.bsiwebinar.com. So be sure and check out that site. So without further ado, let's move to our presenters for today. Dr. Gary Prokop received his BS degree in biology and microbiology from Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and his MS in microbiology and MD from Marshall University School of Medicine in Huntington, West Virginia. Dr. Prokop has presented and published in many venues and has a keen interest in the practical applications of molecular diagnostic methods for the diagnosis and treatment of infections, infectious disease pathology, mycology, and parasitology. Dr. Nathan Ledebour received his PhD from the University of Iowa and subsequently completed a fellowship in clinical and public health microbiology at Washington University in St. Louis. He is a diplomat to the American Board of Microbiology and serves on numerous local and national committees. Dr. Ledebour's research includes the development of diagnostic tools to improve patient care and has worked to improve methods of diagnosis for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus, and partnered with colleagues at the Medical College of Wisconsin to develop an influenza A subtyping assay and characterize the Milwaukee outbreak of the 2009 H1N1. Dr. Deborah Goff received her Bachelor of Pharmacy degree, Doctor of Pharmacy degree, and performed her pharmacy residency at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She is actively involved in developing strategies to improve patient outcomes and control the escalating rate of antimicrobial resistance. She is the first medical educator to conduct a workshop for Apple on medical apps for healthcare professionals using the iPad to educate. Her research interest includes antimicrobial resistance, clinical outcomes research, and innovative ways to educate using technology. So without further ado, I will turn today's proceedings over to our first presenter, Dr. Gary Prokop. Dr. Prokop. Thanks so much. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, share the stage with uh, such distinguished speakers. So let's move on to the um, to the next slide here, and first talk about the uh, problem. And it really is a significant problem when you actually start uh, uh, distilling this down to the numbers of uh, patients that are affected in the United States. It's it's actually phenomenal. Uh, you can look at this um, first bullet point, which is uh, from clinical infectious diseases, and we're talking about a quarter of a million uh, patients, 250,000 diagnosed with bloodstream infections uh, every year. So really one of the, probably one of the most important serious infections uh, in the United States. Um, more important is that there are serious outcomes to these bloodstream infections. Uh, again, when you uh, look, look at the same article, we have mortality rates, and of course this is going to depend on the infecting pathogen as well as the uh, you know, co comorbid states, but bloodstream infections have an average mortality uh, somewhere between 16 and 40 percent, so many patients who have bacteria in their blood will die. Um, sepsis has the uh, unfortunate dubious distinction of being the most expensive cause of hospitalization in the United States. And when we look at uh, the fiscal cliff approaching, um, we've got $15 billion being spent annually in uh, the, the uh, detection, treatment, et cetera, of sepsis. So uh, pretty important from the uh, a number of patients, the severity of disease, and the cost, and we'll talk about these uh, each in a bit more detail. Um, when we look here at the uh, mortality, if we compared an a, a average hospitalization of a patient without sepsis to one with sepsis, we're going to have a mortality rate in the sepsis group that is on average eight times higher than the patients without sepsis. So really a uh, significant problem we have to deal with. Uh, moving on, we can talk uh, a little bit more in detail about the uh, costs of bacteremia. And you've heard people say hospitals are dangerous places to be, right? And one of the reasons for that is hospital-acquired infections. 
and uh, this is the most expensive of the type, the different types of hospital acquired infections that one could contract. The uh, average incremental cost for each uh, hospital acquired bloodstream infection uh, has been um, determined by uh, Stone et al. to be over $36,000. So a uh, pretty significant addition to the cost of hospitalization. Uh, the average length of stay for patients with sepsis uh, in the uh, intensive care unit uh, is 23 days, and you'll see in a moment that this is higher than uh, ICU patients that uh, don't develop sepsis, um, with a uh, total cost of uh, almost $30,000. And you can see part of that cost, of course, is that patients with bloodstream infections are going to need more antimicrobial therapy naturally, and that those um, costs account for something like $160 a day. So we've defined this is an important problem. It's, uh, it's costly. How frequent is it? Well, it's most frequent in patients that are seriously ill, of course, patients that are in the ICU. So when we look at all beds in the hospital, although the ward beds outnumber ICU beds, half of the bloodstream infections are going to occur in the ICU. And that's not surprising with folks with uh, indwelling um, uh, catheters, et cetera, and uh, underlying serious illnesses. Um, and the uh, patients with bloodstream infections, their length of stay, as we mentioned, will be increased, and it's increased anywhere from 7.5 to 25 days. And when you're talking about a thousand dollar on average, a thousand dollar a day hospital stay, these are significant uh, increases in hospital costs. Then let's look at this uh, study by Ibrahim uh, et al. and Chest. This was talking both about the incidence of bloodstream infections and the associated mortality in ICU. And uh, here we, in this study, it looked like about 10% of the patients that were in the ICU had bloodstream infections. And importantly, um, these patients, in one way or another, 61.9, almost 62% of these patients were somehow on inappropriate antimicrobial therapy. Uh, but only about 28% uh, were on appropriate therapy, and you can see a significant average mortality uh, in patients in the ICU with bloodstream infections. Um, the other thing we uh, are all concerned about is antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, there are a good studies and uh, several good studies that demonstrate that a large percentage, and this one set up to 50% of antimicrobial use is either unnecessary or inappropriate, people treating for viral infections, et cetera. And we all know and are concerned that abuse and overuse of antimicrobial agents leads to antibacterial resistance, just points of fact that we all know are true. So uh, we're a firm believer in the need for rapid results, and we believe that directly affects patient outcomes. So uh, up to 40% of patients uh, uh, with bacteremia uh, have been documented to have uh, inadequate initial antibiotic treatment in one way or another. Uh, it's also been uh, noted by uh, Kumar and all in uh, critical care medicine that each hour that appropriate antimicrobial treatment is delayed, there's actually an increase in the likelihood that that patient will die. And in this study, the, uh, the finding was 7.6%. Uh, we also know that delaying appropriate treatment up to 45 hours is an independent predictor um, of infection-related death caused by Staph aureus bacteremia. It's pretty important in many ICUs the number one cause of bacteremia, and we know that when we look at traditional methods, um, it's going to take us somewhere between 24 and 48 hours to make that identification. So rapid results could, uh, could uh, do um, affect outcomes. The other point to consider is getting rid of contaminants uh, and not having those overtreated. Etc. And so uh, molecular methods can uh, be used, as you'll hear in a little bit, to identify these. And you know, up to 34% of all signal positive blood cultures have been shown to be uh, due to contaminants in one study. Um, we know that patients with contaminants.
contaminated blood cultures have increased associated costs, not surprising. Sometimes they're not discharged until they get a negative blood culture and they get antibiotics when, it doesn't, when they're not needed, et cetera. And uh, we know that false positive blood cultures are associated with overall uh, costs, and in one study it was documented to be 35 times higher than the cost uh, uh, of similar patients associated with true negatives. So with that introduction and definition of the problem, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Uh, Ledebar to uh, talk about the solution and rapid diagnostic testing. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, and that was an absolutely excellent overview of the clinical problem that bloodstream infections present in managing patients. You hit on two extremely important points. First and foremost, that this needs to be a collaborative solution, that in order to get a more timely results to clinicians and to ensure that patients are treated appropriately, we need to do this in a collaborative manner that shares responsibility and shares um, the benefit of this between the patients, between the laboratory, between pharmacy, between nursing, and every the entire healthcare team needs to be involved. Secondly, you hit on an incredibly important point, that turnaround time is still a significant issue. We're delaying results up to 72 hours to getting patients on appropriate antibiotic therapy. And in large part, this is due to the fact that we depend on bacterial doubling times. We depend on bacterial growth. We culture blood, we send it to the laboratory, and the laboratory places the blood on a continuous monitoring blood culture instrument in order to monitor for growth. Most blood cultures will typically turn positive within the first 24 hours, and when the blood culture does turn positive, the laboratory will pull that blood culture, will perform a gram stain, as I've shown here, and as a result of performing that gram stain, uh, as a result of performing that gram stain, they will then uh, call the physician, notify the physician that the blood culture is positive, and the results of the gram stain, with this example showing gram-positive cocci in pairs and chains, indicating to the physician that a potential streptococcus or enterococcus may be present, and the physician will change, modify, or review antimicrobial therapy to determine if empiric therapy is appropriate. Now, it's important to note that at this stage, when the blood culture is uh, is reported as positive, physicians will respond more than 90% of the time to the laboratory result. So as we consider new techniques in order to improve the turnaround time of diagnostics, one of the things that we need to consider is implementing things where physicians will respond. Once we've notified the physician and the empiric therapy may have been modified, the laboratory will continue to grow the organism, typically growing it on solid media, once the organism has been grown on solid media, uh, the organism will be identified. And finally, 48 to 72 hours after the blood culture was drawn, a full identification and susceptibility will be reported out to the physician. Now, the limitation of this is that if we look at physician response to this information, fewer than 60% of physicians will actually respond to the identification and the susceptibility. In large part, this is due to the fact that the patient may be getting better, that they may have forgotten that the blood culture uh, is still pending, or that empiric therapy uh, is going to continue as, uh, as uh, prescribed. Several studies have evaluated the benefit of a rapid diagnostic technique for directly from positive blood cultures. The first study that I'd like to evaluate today, or to discuss today, was published by Lye and colleagues in Therapeutic Clinical Risk Management. In this study, they used PNA fish or peptide nucleic acid fluorescence in situ hybridization. It's a microscopic technique that will allow you to fluorescently label bacteria in order to compare standard of care management of patients with bloodstream infections versus a combination of fish intervention once the blood culture bottle has signaled positive, followed by notification of the physician. Patients enrolled in this study were split into two groups with 101 patients being uh, placed into the standard of care arm and 101 patients being placed into uh, the, the notification arm combined with FISH uh, technology. The authors of this study looked at several outcomes, including antibiotic use, mortality, length of stay, and cost of hospitalization. 
When they looked at mortality, looking at all patients enrolled in the study, the mean uh, the mean da- the median days of, on antibiotics in those patients that were receiving standard of care was three days. For patients that were receiving uh, that received the fish technology, they found that the mean days on antibiotics was one day on average, and this was a, t- a statistically significant difference. When they broke apart the patients that were enrolled in the study and separated those that were in the intensive care unit versus those that were not in the intensive care unit, they found a median difference in days of antibiotics of five days for those that were in the standard of care arm and two days versus those that were in the notification arm. And this difference was not statistically significant. When they looked at non-intensive care use pa- or non-intensive care patients, the median days of a- on antibiotics for patients uh, that were not in the intensive care unit were three days versus those that were um, that received the notification protocol was one day, a difference that was significant to, the, uh, to a p-value of 0.05. When they break up, broke apart the two different analytes that were detected in the study, so coagulase negative staph in one group, organisms that are frequently associated with blood culture contaminants versus staph aureus versus those organisms that we nearly always consider to be pathogens, again, they found significant differences. In patients that were in the standard of care arm at all locations in the hospital, they found an average duration of antibiotics of 2.5 days versus the notification arm combined with PNA fish, they found a zero day, um, zero median days on antibiotics, a difference that was significant. When they looked at Staphylococcus aureus across all locations in the hospital, they found no difference, something we would absolutely expect, because all of these patients will be treated as potential pathogens. When Lai and colleagues evaluated mortality associated with standard of care, again versus the notification arm combined with PNA fish, they found significant differences again. When they looked at all patients that were enrolled in the study, Comparing standard of care versus the notification arm, they found that the number of the number and percentage of deaths decreased statistically across all locations in the, uh, in the hospital. Those patients that received standard of care had an average duration or had an average mortality rate of 16.8 percent, versus those that received the notification arm had an average mortality rate of 7.9 percent, a difference that was statistically significant. Among the ICU patients there was a significant difference in mortality, 47.8% mortality in the ICU among all patients uh, in the standard of care arm versus those in the notification arm, an average mortality of 9.5%. When they broke this apart and looked at differences among the coagulase negative staphylococci, as well as staphylococcus aureus, they found there were significant differences across the coagulase negative staphylococci as well as in the Staph aureus arm, indicating that patients with Staph aureus bacteremia were treated more appropriately in a faster time frame, and as a result, mortality was reduced. Finally, when Lai and colleagues evaluated the improvements in costs, they saw significant reductions in costs between the standard of care arm and the notification arm. When they looked at all locations in the hospital, they found that the average cost of the median cost uh, of hospitalization was $92,000 for those in standard of care con- compared to those that were in the notification arm where the average cost was $72,000. When they broke apart the intensive care unit patients, those that were in the usual or the standard of care arm uh, had two hundred an average cost of hospitalization of $245,000 versus those that were in the uh, notification arm had an average cost of hospitalization of $143,000. A second study published by Fry and colleagues very recently in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology evaluated the benefit uh, in terms of time to presumptive identification and in terms of time to appropriate antimicrobial therapy using a PCR to detect and differentiate MRSA or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus from methicillin-susceptible Staphylococcus aureus. What they found was that when they compared their pre-PCR population or their standard of care population to those patients that received a PCR once the blood culture signaled positive, they found an average reduction in the time to identification of of 13 hours, which was statistically significant. 
when they broke this apart across MRSA, MSSA, and coagulase-negative staphylococci, they found the difference in time to identification was a reduction with the use of PCR between 11 and 11.4 hours and 16.6 hours, and in each case, this difference was statistically significant. Now, one of the things that was unique about this study was that the laboratory simply reported out the results of the PCR, and it wasn't combined with an antimicrobial stewardship program. So when they looked at, in the pre-PCR population, compared to the post-PCR population, and they looked at now time to, impure, or to optimal antibiotic therapy, in the absence of an antimicrobial stewardship program, they found that there was no difference, uh, in a, no statistically significant difference, in the time to appropriate antibiotic therapy, further emphasizing that if you're going to implement rapid diagnostic techniques, it needs to be done across disciplines in the hospital setting. Now, we set out to evaluate the Nanosphere BCGP test for identification of bacteria from positive blood cultures. This panel was unique from all others that had been previously designed in that, number one, it was a microarray-based panel compared to other systems were based on microscopy or on um, low density or low, uh, low multiplexing PCR. So the PCR-based assays allow you to distinguish differences between staph, uh, between MRSA and methicillin susceptible staph, but because of the limits in multiplexing, they're not able to go much farther than that. We found this panel to be somewhat unique in the fact that it includes genus targets in addition to important species targets. So the panel includes uh, genus targets for the genus Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and Listeria, and then breaks apart and identifies important species to the genus and species level. So among the genus Staphylococcus, you'll get a signal positive for, for genus, and if you have Staphylococcus aureus, you'll get a signal positive also for the species target Staphylococcus aureus. This was pulled out um, separately because of the importance as a pathogen of Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus epidermidis was separately identified because of the importance of this organism associated with methicillin resistance. And Staphylococcus lugdunensis was pulled out because this organism, while phenotypically identified as a coagulase negative Staphylococci, needs to be managed much more like a Staphylococcus aureus or as a pathogen. Same is true among the genus Streptococcus, and then there are also targets for Enterococcus facium as well as Enterococcus faecalis. Resistance targets, the MEK-A resistance target associated with methicillin resistance in the genus Staphylococcus will, uh, will only be positive or only, will only be indicated if the organism is identified as genus Staphylococcus and either as Staph aureus or Staph epidermidis. And the vancomycin resistance determinants, VAN A and VAN B, will only be flagged positive when associated with the genus Enterococcus, either Enterococcus facium or Enterococcus faecalis. The way the system works is that consumables are loaded onto a processor, and the consumables will include uh, an extraction tray, and they will include pipette tips, as well as the array, uh, as the, well as the array and reagent pack. So once all the consumables are loaded onto the instrument, the blood culture sample is placed into uh, the sample well. And once placed into the sample well, um, automated processing has begun. The system will perform the extraction, the detection step, and the hybridization steps automatically in about an hour and a half. And once completed, the microarray reagent pack will be removed from the microarray, and the microarray is read into the reader and results are available within one to two minutes. We evaluated the performance of this method uh, at a, using a multi-center clinical trial, comparing the performance of routine blood culture to the direct identification test. We found sensitivity of the target among all organisms ranged from 93% to 100%, with the genus Staphylococcus demonstrating 98% sensitivity 99% specificity, and specific targets within the genus Staphylococcus. Staph aureus identified 99.9% .9 sensitive and demonstrated 100% uh, specificity. Among Staphylococcus epidermidis, sensitivity was 93.1%, 
specificity was 98.9%, and for staph lug denensis, sensitivity was 95%, with 100% specificity. Results were similar among the genus Streptococcus, as well as among Listeria species, and among the Enterococcus species. Breaking apart the data, looking at just the Medical College of Wisconsin verification study, we found similar results to those that were uh, conducted in the clinical trial. Sensitivity ranged from 100% down to 83.3%, and specificity ranged from 97% to 100%. I want to comment specifically on the Enterococcus facium strain that we enrolled. We had one strain that was a false negative by the very gene. This was identified as Enterococcus facium uh, by our biochemical methods, but on sequencing, um, uh, but on sequencing revealed an inconclusive result. So while we consider this to be a false negative, I truly believe that this is not an Enterococcus facium strain. When we look at mixed cultures or polymicrobial infections uh, and compare the performance of the varigene system to the performance of our routine methods, we find the sensitivity of the varigene system to be 100% when we consider only those targets that are included on the system and specificity to also be nearing 100%. If we look at a, uh, a few specific examples, among culture one, the organisms that were identified in the culture um, included uh, Streptococcus agalactiae and Proteus mirabilis. The very gene indicated Streptococcus agalactiae. And when, we, and when we went back and reviewed this individual culture, we found that the, strepto, the Streptococcus agalactiae is what was detected in the gram state. We didn't detect the Proteus mirabilis until the subculture had been performed, indicating this was likely a minor species um, that may have been present in the culture. Looking at a second example, um, culture number five, where the, um, the subculture identified the subculture from the positive blood culture bottle indicated a vancomycin resistant Enterococcus facium and a Staphylococcus hemolyticus. The very gene identified the Enterococcus facium associated the vancomycin resistance with the enterococcus. It also identified a staphylococcus species, which would be a coag negative staph. Now, one of the important things I want to mention here is that as the laboratory is communicating these results to the clinicians, it is incredibly important that the laboratory state to the clinician or involve the pharmacy in interpreting this information. The very gene system will report out, as I've shown in culture five, enterococcus facium and van A. The laboratory needs to ensure that the physician understands that that van A is associated with the enterococcus facium, and that is now a VRE. That needs to be very, very clearly communicated to any users or any downstream uh, users of this assay. I also want to very briefly note that while much of the data that I presented here was generated using the BD Backtech culture system, our laboratory has also recently switched to the Versatrek system, and we've demonstrated similar results using the Versatrek system, which initially wasn't FDA cleared, but today has been FDA cleared uh, for use with the Varigene system. Finally, I want to briefly uh, mention also the results of the susceptibility information. When we looked at the sensitivity and the specificity of the BCGP assay for detection of MEC-A, VAN-A, and VAN-B, among 398 strains where we detected methicillin resistance, we found a sensitivity of the varigene to be 94.2% and specificity to be 98.2%. When we break this apart and look at Staphylococcus aureus, compared to Staphylococcus epidermidis. Sensitivity of Staphylococcus aureus, 97.5%. Specificity, 98.8%. And among the gene, and among the coagulase negative Staphylococci, the sensitivity was 92%. Specificity, 81%. And this is, again, in part due to the limitations of a biochemical gold standard for identification of coagulase negative staph. There were a number, a number of strains of coagulase negative staph where methicillin resistance was detected, but because it wasn't called out as a staph epi, the very gene didn't identify it. Among Van A and Van B, sensitivity ranged from 94.2% to 100%, and specificity was 99.8% to 100%.
to 100%. In conclusion, or uh, before I conclude, I also want to very briefly mention that we're currently partnering with Nanosphere in order to evaluate a gram-negative solution, uh, so detection of gram-negative organisms. And this panel will include the Acinetobacter species, Proteus species, Enterobacter species, and Citrobacter, as well as species-specific targets for E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Klebsiella oxytoca, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Serratia marsessions, as well as a number of resistance determinants that are associated with these organisms. To conclude, I want to, uh, I want to suggest that rapid identification of bacteria uh, is going to be a significant clinical benefit to our patients and will allow us to manage our patients in a more optimal manner in less time. The BCGP panel contains a broad multiplex of targets. It can be available in a 24-7 turnaround time, requiring less than five minutes hands-on time, and providing results in less than two to two and a half hours. With that, I'm going to turn over the talk today to our final speaker, Dr. Deborah Goff from The Ohio State University, and she's going to tell you more about the importance of this being a multidisciplinary approach. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, as he stated, I, my name is Deborah Goff. I practice at The Ohio State University Medical Center and want to talk about how stewardship can integrate with these programs. So if we look at the goals of stewardship, it's really multifactorial. Long-term goal is combating the emergence of resistance. Short-term is improving clinical outcomes and controlling cost. So my focus today is to discuss how rapid diagnostic testing, specifically the Verigene, can be used to improve immediately clinical outcomes and impact costs, and then with the long-term goal, combating resistance. So at Ohio State, we have a very active stewardship program. We have four infectious disease trained clinical pharmacists, and we work collaboratively every day with our clinical microbiology lab, led, led by Dr. Preeti Pancholi and uh, Jawan Balada Lasat. So I want to state, if your program is just getting started with stewardship and you don't have four, you don't even have one clinical pharmacist in your hospital doing stewardship, um, I want to encourage the microbiologists to really reach out to their pharmacists to help them get this message out about new diagnostic tests. If you're implementing this and you don't have an active stewardship program, Work with your pharmacist to create either a newsletter for the medical staff. Often they're on different committees than the microbiologists, maybe P&T, an antibiotic subcommittee. Any way to get the message out and explain to physicians the clinical application of these tests would be to your benefit. Um, because as we've heard from the two, two previous speakers, Communication and understanding the implications of these tests are critical to making them work. You know, it was a great last uh, study he reviewed showing without stewardship there was no difference. So the most rapid test won't mean anything if nobody knows how to interpret the results. So that's kind of the goal we want to uh, work towards. However, in most U.S. hospitals, if um, CMS has their way, stewardship will be mandated as part of an infection control criteria in all U.S. hospitals. So that will probably be the norm in uh, the next year, and it won't be an option. So let's go to the next slide and talk about the flow of test. If we look at what's available in most hospitals that do not have rapid diagnostic tests available, you draw a blood culture, you wait for the growth, generally 18 to 24 hours. Microlab does a gram stain, calls the physician or nurse, and then you wait for susceptibility data and definitive results. And that's basically about a three-day process. With rapid diagnostic tests, once that blood culture grows, we're able to implement and change therapy at that point in time. So it speeds up the timeline. Um, and as Dr. Prokop discussed, every hour counts in the management of bacteremia. It's been shown by Dr. Kolov's data. So it's very important. So one of the keys is implementing it. And when our micro lab implemented the rapid diagnostic test, um, this was Cephid's instrument for MRSA staph aureus blood cultures, the real-time PCR, which I have to note, those kits are no longer available. They're off the market at this point in time. The key was how does the information flow in a large hospital? 
So they presented the data uh, to our antibiotic subcommittee and our stewardship program recommended we implement this test. They had done the in-house validation, and we really discussed at stewardship together how do we have our medical staff informed about this test, and how are they going to understand the results? So how the micro lab has to report it. Um, my question was, are the interpretation of the test results intuitive to non-infectious disease-trained physicians reading these reports? Um, will physicians be prompted to change therapy on their own? So on the left is how the micro lab had to report the test. And we all know you're under FDA labeling. You can't, um, you know, wordsmith the results and change how you want it to st uh, be stated in the report. But a stewardship team can help interpret. So just to kind of drive this point home, this is how the Cephid instrument test results uh, would be reported by our micro lab as required by the labeling, which you see on the left. Gram positive coccyne groups, negative for staph aureus, DNA by real time PCR, negative for MRSA. And on the right is what the stewardship pharmacist interpreted it for the physicians. And you might go, oh, everybody would know what this means. Well, actually, that isn't true. I did a little test, I covered up the right hand side and said, tell me what this means. And they're like, positive for staph aureus, negative for MRSA, um, let me think, coag negative staph. It was amazing, many couldn't get it. And they said, you know what, you're telling us what it isn't, why don't you just tell us what it is? So I think it's a good thing to realize some of the things that we think are intuitive and everybody will know, not everybody's an ID expert nor cares to be one. Um, they just want it simple. And on the right is simple, but not something you can put in the uh, computer results. You can't change what the test says. But we can help interpret that and go, this would mean you have MRSA and this is the antibiotic that we would recommend. We'll switch that patient. Will you like me to place that order? And as a pharmacist, we can place the order as a verbal without waiting for the physician to co-sign. Unlike a nurse, the orders have to be co-signed. So we can very quickly get the patient on optimal therapy. So let me describe the study we published in Clinical Infectious Diseases as a result of our stewardship team's approach to managing um, Staph aureus bacteremia using a rapid diagnostic test. Our goal was to evaluate not only the clinical but the economic impact. We all know the micro labs have budgets and trying to get these new diagnostic tests into your budget is somewhat of a challenge. And if you're in a silo budget, the micro labs one budget, the pharmacy department's another, you know it's a tough sell especially in these economic times. So if you can work as a team and really look at the economic impact, and the micro lab's job is not to go do pharmacokinetic and outcome management and economic analysis of management of diseases. Um, that's really what our stewardship team should be doing. So we partnered in helping uh, to justify this, and I will say we have um, an enormous amount of rapid diagnostic tests thanks to their great work. So we wanted to evaluate the impact of this with interventions um, by our stewardship pharmacist. So we looked at a uh, comparative study doing a before after, three months before, three months after. Why three months? Because we didn't have a year to sit and justify the expense of it. So we looked at the difference in time from blood culture draw to optimal anti-staphylococcal therapy. We looked at hospital length of stay, mortality, and cost. And these are the outcome parameters that hospital administrators understand. So even though a test might cost more in the micro lab, the antibiotic I might recommend in the pharmacy budget might all be more if your overall cost of care to manage this patient driven by length of stay is less, that's a win all the way around. And what we were able to show is we had a 1.6 day decrease in time to optimal therapy in the management of MSSA. So most patients are all started on vancomycin when you suspect Staph aureus bacteremia. But we know definitively in the management of MSSA, nafcillin or cefazolin is superior in outcomes compared to vancomycin. Uh, unfortunately, that is not known by every single physician. And so we directed a lot of that therapy over to nafcillin. For patients with MRSA, um, again, most are empirically started on vancomycin. 
for some, knowing previous admissions for staph bacteremia, previous MICs to Vanco, we would recommend daptomycin and would transition them to that antimicrobial. So let's look a little bit at the other outcome. Our overall length of stay in the total population was reduced by 6.2 days. Um, that was a significant driver for the cost. So the mean cost reduction per episode of staph bacteremia was decreased by $21,000, which was statistically significant. A lot of that was driven by getting them out of the ICU, the most expensive part, uh, place in the hospital, uh, more rapidly. So this was an overall um, great outcome and uh, really allowed us to expand our stewardship program by having outcome data is not only an improvement, uh, we did look at mortality, it trended in the right direction, but in a three month pre-post, the N was too small to be statistically significant, but clearly was in the right direction. So this was a great start to our expanded stewardship program and looking at the economic and clinical impact. Others have looked at this in earlier publications. Dr. Forrest showed a lower hospital cost. This is using the PNA fish for staph aureus, um, looking at contaminated blood cultures with coagulase negative staph by discontinuing uh, vancomycin earlier, an overall cost savings of $4,000 in this uh, published study. Um, again, to reiterate, in our study, uh, Carrie Bauer was the lead that really did most of these interventions, and it was with collaboration with our micro lab. They had to place a second phone call to the stewardship team with these results. So more work on their part. Uh, they, uh, by a critical lab standard, would always call the physician or nurse with the blood culture results, uh, but they placed a second call to stewardship. But then we could immediately enter in uh, the most effective antibiotic therapy into the computer order entry system. You know, a lot of times when you call, the call goes to a nurse. The nurse then has to track down the physician. They could be in the OR, and literally hours can go by before that order gets activated. So that, again, a reiteration, $21,000 per episode of staph bacteremia was uh, saved by using a rapid PCR for staph aureus bacteremia. Uh, second study looking at um, a MEC-A gene showed a positive uh, uh, reduction of three days in length of stay um, in the management of staph bacteremia. Two others looking at outcomes. Um, showed a 9% reduction in mortality, identifying coag negative staph earlier. Uh, Peggy Carver's group at University of Michigan did a homebrew MEC-8 uh, testing and showed a 25-hour reduction in time to optimal antimicrobial therapy. Uh, herself as the clinical pharmacist made those calls. Again, it's very similar to our study. Time to optimal antimicrobial therapy is the name of the game. The faster you get the most effective antibiotic on board, the better the outcome will be. And we really would anticipate um, this to be the same for any of these. With Viragene, you can uh, look at um, strep pneumonia, bank resistant enterococci. You know, most patients, when you draw a blood culture thinking of a gram positive, they're going to be on vancomycin. So what if you knew a VRE two days sooner and, and put them on appropriate therapy, whether that might be lenezla, daptomycin, or ampicillin, will be hospital dependent. But do you think it would make a difference? Absolutely. And then think of the gram-negative targets. This is one under... Um, uh, clinical trials right now with fear, uh, with nanosphere, but the potential with their gram-negative targets, you know, if I knew definitively I had pseudomonas or I did not have pseudomonas, I had an E. coli or a CLEB, uh, do you think I could de-escalate patients off of their anti-pseudomonal antimicrobials? Absolutely. So the future potential of these is just tremendous and really will make a difference in stewardship programs. So some of the lab flow uh, concerns with rapid diagnostic testing, the CLIA rating, what's the level, skill level of your micro techs actually doing the work? How much training do they need? The physical space, every time I go to our micro lab, I'm amazed at how many um, things they cram into their lab. They desperately need more space. So how much room does this instrument take up? Um, how big is it, the physical space? And then the hands-on time by the microtech. So really just to summarize, to make this work, communication is the key. The micro lab is the expert in identifying these new tests. That's not my um, area of expertise. We rely on them to bring these to stewardship. 
what's available. Don't tell me the cost. Don't let the cost be a, a roadblock because if you can get someone out of the hospital faster by using a rapid diagnostic test, I can pretty much assure you we can cost justify any instrument because sitting in the hospital is where most of the expense is. It's not the antibiotic we're giving them. It's not the diagnostic test. It's the length of stay that drives the cost of care in uh, our hospitals. So the stewardship economic model can really be used to project these cost savings. Many of us function in silo budgets. The micro's got its own budget. Pharmacy department's got its own budget. But your CEO knows it's the length of stay in your hospital that's driving the cost. So by working together with a team approach, you really can make not only improvement in patient outcomes, but an economic impact on patient care. So with that, I'll stop and turn it back to Dr. Prokop. Thank you. Uh, both of those were just phenomenal talks, and I think really brought home the uh, uh, need to um, the need to bring in the uh, rapid diagnostics as well as the need to have a high quality effector arm to, uh, to to get the patients on the right antibiotic or stop inappropriate antibiotics. So um, let's uh, go through a few conclusion slides, and I think some of these things were, were touched on. Uh, just before we do, I wanted to you know say some of the reasons why we were. Uh, you know, on board with, you know, rapid diagnostic testing, uh, molecular diagnostic testing early. Um, you know, one of our first drivers was this, you know, important differentiation between such a highly significant pathogen as Staph aureus and our most common uh, contaminant coagulase negative Staphylococci. And so that was really a driver to, um, to uh, bring this on board. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is so attractive about the technology we're talking about today is it's not just a single yes/no answer. You're really getting multiple uh, answers uh, in one assay. We also, of course, wanted to look at the identification of you know causative a agents of uh, serious infections. Um, with some of the coagulase negative staphylococci, it's a clinical call, but you know sometimes we'll have patients with um, a uh, central line, uh, you know, very delicate patients, low platelets, uh, could be very dangerous to actually change those lines, et cetera. You know, uh, delicate tissue status and, you know, in, in the middle of chemotherapy, et cetera. So there are situations where clinicians will actually consider trying to treat through a line infection with a low-grade pathogen. So having rapid diagnostics that could, could uh, put, put them on that path is also important. We already talked about, but I think it is extremely important um, uh, both for decreasing um, the spread of resistance and to de decrease cost and to decrease um, the you know untoward effects of uh, you know antibiotics, um, uh, allergic reactions, etc. Is discontinuation of unnecessary th a therapy for contaminants. Um, we, of course, also brought on some rapid diagnostics for differentiation of yeast. And, uh, you know, a brief consideration of the fungi is important because the fungi are pretty different from uh, bacterial microbial pathogens in that their identification largely predicts their susceptibility. So, you know, you know you've got a cruzi eye, uh, you know you've got an organism that's re resistant to fluconazole. Uh, Albicans in a patient that hasn't seen fluconazole, you likely can treat with that much less expensive than some of the newer triazoles. But, you know, what were we really missing and what were we looking for next? We were, we were really missing susceptibility information for uh, the gram positives that we were growing after. We really did not have a rapid MECA um, answer, and you can see that some of the commercial approaches to that have really fall, fallen, uh, fall, fallen pretty flat and been taken off the market. So the presence of... You know, susceptibility information um, is pretty important, uh, as you've already heard. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see something uh, for yeast and some of the fungi that can show up in, in blood. Uh, maybe there's some opportunities in, you know, bronchial lavage specimens. And again, I'm glad to hear that, you know, Nate and team are working on a gram-negative panel, of course, you know, gram-negatives uh, and their, uh, you know, various um, types of resistance are extremely important for us. 
why do we adopt it? Well, you know, kind of back then, and it was a little while ago now, you know, we just had the intuitive belief that early accurate information is better. You know, we said we wanted to do this, and we didn't get any pushback, and we did it. Um, there are other groups. Uh, I, I saw some friends from Duke were, were dialed in as participants. Barbara Alexander did, a, did, a, did exactly what Dr. Goff had, had mentioned. She basically demonstrated that she could bring down pharmacy costs, and you can see the amount there per patient, um, if she could implement rapid molecular diagnostic tests for the identification of yeast species in blood. So uh, that, as well as some of the great work by Dr. Forrest, who really was one of the early champions of this, um, you know, rapid diagnostics going directly to a um, stewardship team um, and demonstrated many of the things we've talked about, decreased length of stay, uh, decreased vancomycin use, decreased cost per patient. So those were um, some of the driving uh, er earlier reports that had us bring these on. I will, I will say that, you know, what you've already heard about, about laboratories, pharmacy, uh, you know, other areas working together and actually talking to the CEOs is becoming increasingly important. Uh, the laboratory uh, either has or will become a cost center with healthcare reform. Many areas will become a, a cost center. And one of the reasons for this is we're probably going to get paid by you know, in, in, in entire patient episode rather than this inpatient outpatient. We're already getting paid by episode for inpatients. That's likely going to expand for outpatient also. So the days of making money on outpatient testing are over, uh, or they'll, they'll, they'll soon be over. So what's going to be really critically important is every move we make, we're going to have to demonstrate value for our actions. And that's okay because laboratorians, uh, we by our nature are, are pretty good measurers and we can measure things and put together reports and, and uh, speak clearly on why we're doing what we're doing. So it's really important that, you know, laboratorians, uh, you know, our PharmD colleagues, et cetera, really maintain a uh, position at the leadership table. Um, and if we don't, I think there's great threats that uh, there's a great risk that others will make decisions concerning laboratory testing. I think this is really a uh, opportunity for us to help our um, hospital systems leaders really change the system. And, you know, that has been the approach we, we have been taking and it's been well embraced by our leadership. Outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. This is what it's all going to be about. You're going to have to measure it, prove it, and push it forward. And um, this, is, this is different than some of the thinking. We get it specimen, we test it, we report that out. Those are things we're definitely going to have to do well and continue to do well, but we're going to have to uh, think and function at a higher level. You know, so, you know, kind of in conclusion, healthcare is definitely changing, no doubt about it. We need to think about and learn to practice uh, high quality medicine at Medicare reimbursement levels. We're going to have to really reduce waste. ACO type models are going to play a larger role in the future. And I have to listen carefully to this. There will be no future reimbursement for hospital acquired infections and readmissions. What does that mean practically? That means our hospital leaders are going to become keenly interested in preventing hospital-acquired infections and readmissions and keenly interested in um, people that can help them do that, and, and you are those people. So um, as, as these um, changes occur in healthcare, I think we can actually utilize them to our benefit to really help uh, improve patient care. Rapid diagnostics, you've heard about it all afternoon now. They really are linked to improved patient outcomes. You've got to have a strong effector arm as well as a key diagnostic test. Maybe these can be linked to reduce healthcare costs, decrease length of stay, decrease pharmacy costs, decrease HAIs and readmission and improved antimicrobial stewardship. And so um, really evidence-based medicine and good business are really the order of the day. Most importantly is some is the, the first one there, improved patient outcomes. I think that by doing this and doing it well, I hate to say it, even though cost may be the driver, what's going to be the real benefit is what happens to patients. We're going to have patients get out of the hospital uh, better, faster, and that's really why we all went into the medical field, isn't it? 
with that, I will uh, turn it back over uh, to our moderator. And again, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. And thank you, Dr. Prokop and Dr. Goff and Ledebor. Wonderful presentation. I know I'm speaking for everyone here today when I say that. Um, we have uh, reached our the edge of the, uh, the cliff. It's not the fiscal cliff, but it's the cliff for today's webinar. So the good news, though, is that all of your questions can be posed and will be answered on the bsiwebinar.com website. Uh, Susanna will put that in here again. She just did. Good for you. And you can copy and paste that link into Word or something so that you have that and, and if you haven't already bookmarked the website. Lots of great resources there, so that's where you should go to get uh, your questions, to pose your questions, and then to see what the answers are later. Let me remind you again that today's recording and slides will also be available from this website, bsiwebinar.com. Uh, give us uh, just a little bit of time, a few hours, and uh, I believe in the, uh, the resources will be posted there. Once again, a reminder about today's PACE credit. If you would like to receive PACE credit or Florida CE 